All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope everyone had a great week. Let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we will get started on our uh, on our discourse into the last chapter of Ecclesiastes. So let's go ahead and pray, and when we'll start. Lord, thank you so much uh, just for this opportunity for us to be here, to be present. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for your truth. Thank you, God, that we can glean from it and have our outlook changed. And as a result, change also our conduct and how we see life here and our activity um, um, under the sun. I pray, God, that this would be profitable and beneficial and that overall, Lord, you would be glorified. We thank you so much, Lord. Lord, it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started and uh, review um, what we've been talking about for the past three chapters in terms of our, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, first of all, again, we've been looking at the contents of a research proposal and we've been using this particular um, uh, um, uh, mode or method as uh, as a primer to look at the book of Ecclesiastes. We start off with the introduction, of course, examining why this research ought to be done. Koheleth kind of gives us his thesis statement in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. Then we go into the literature review, which is a description of what is known about the area of the research that one is attempting to study. In this case, um, Kohalath, that is Solomon, begins to look at nature in the cyclical order of nature, right? And concludes that if everything is the same, generations come, generations go, right? Uh, nothing is not really new. Then what is really the purpose of our living here? That brings us to the rationale, a description of the questions that are examined and the reason for the explanation Kohalath gives that explanation in verses 13 and 14 of this particular book here. Then he spends the la uh, a good chunk of the book talking about the method and design. And we looked at that. He actually uses two examples, um, naturalistic observations. That is, he doesn't really interfere with any of the activities. He just kind of examines them from afar, from a distance. Right and uses God's word to analyze this data. <laughs> then he uses uh, his self as a case study, particularly in chapter two, and then takes his activities and filters them through God's wisdom, um, analyzing that particular data. And now we come to the significance and conclusion, which is how this research ought to be observed in the overall analysis of the data. So now he's just summing up everything that he's talked about for the past basically seven chapters, right, uh, from two to eight. And he's uh, drawing out all of the main themes, um, all the things that we ought to remember concerning all the data and all the analysis that he's kind of looked at based upon his observations, using God's wisdom, of course. So now uh, the review from last week. Um, uh, we finished off chapter 11, and uh, in Kohalath's final statement, um, he underscores uh, that if you're young, you ought not to waste your youth. That is, that is the main hub or the main focus of the rest of that discourse in chapter 11, that the things that are not beneficial for you or not beneficial to you or the things that cause undue pain sorrow and regret, do not do those, just avoid them, right? This is important because he mentions that young uh, youth is temporary, more temporary than life itself, right? And that one ought to cherish that and find that very precious. It is quickly here and quickly gone. Instead, pursue your interest and enjoy your life, but don't forget to live intentionally while you're doing it. And this is uh, kind of his uh, main thought throughout this entire book, right? It does not matter how old one is, right? Whether they are uh, young, younger, or older, um, the focus and the goal is one ought to live intentionally. 
to live with wisdom. Again, Koalath, after giving all these pithy sayings and quotes underscoring all the data from his naturalistic observations, again, in humanity's activity at the end of this chapter, shifts gears to focus the temper on the temporary reality of being young and how one ought to live with purpose or intentional at this time of one's life. As I mentioned last week, this greases the skids for his biggest and final point that we see in chapter 12. Okay. Chapter 12 is particularly from verses 1 to 8, essentially is a recap of one's youth and talking about the effects of old age. We will get into that this morning. In chapter 12, verse 1, we read the following statement. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no delight in them. Now, the word remember is the same word that was used last week, zakar, to, uh, to, uh, to remember, to recall, right? And so Koholeth tells the reader, the congregation of Israel, um, and those who were reading to recall their creator in the days of their youth. This word creator is the Hebrew word bara. This word appears 54 times in the Hebrew scriptures. One time in the book of Ecclesiastes, and that's here in chapter 12, verse 1. This word, interestingly enough, is a verb. Okay, And it is in the qual stem. Right um, now, when it comes to this word creator, depending on what stem it's in, that tells you how to uh, uh, kind of interpret it. Right. So when this word on the qual stem, it is basically to create, to shape or to form the creator or the former. Right. Now, this word is also not just in the qual stem, but it is a participle active. Okay. Now, if you recall about maybe it was several months ago, I don't even remember at this point. But if you recall in a previous uh, uh, lesson that I had, had mentioned, when you have a word that is in this form, particularly a verb, and it's in the participle active, it's kind of like an articular participle. It explains a certain type of individual. Okay, or a certain type of person. Now, to confuse matters, this word is also plural. What? So, this word is explaining a certain type of person or members who have the quality and characteristic of creating. Now, even though this word is a verb and is in the plural, I think this fits very nicely with a noun that is also in the plural. We find this noun that's in the plural in Genesis 1. Again, God is the word here, Elohim, is the word here. This Hebrew word is in the plural as well. El is the Hebrew word for God that is singular. Plural is used here. We can also see the act of Elohim, that is God creating the heavens and the earth. We see this in chapter one, verse one, and we see the description of how he does this in chapter one, verse two and following, okay? Now, to underscore this point as well, the word creator, bara which is in the same type, the same verb, the same participle, the same, the same participle active, same qual stem, is also found in Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, exactly. Says this here. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, Elohim, the Lord, the creator, Barah, same noun, same verb. Of the ends of the earth, 
does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. So again, we have the everlasting God mentioned here, and he is attributed in Isaiah as the creator of the ends of the earth. The same word can be found in verse 43, or I'm sorry, of chapter 43, verses 14 to 15 in Isaiah. He says, thus says the Lord, your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent, I have sent to Babylon, and I will bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans, into the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. <laughs> even though the word God is not used in this text, Certainly, the context tells us that this is God who's speaking, right? And he mentions through Isaiah that he is the creator of Israel and also their king. <coughs> so this word creator that Koheleth uses is talking about God. So remember also God or your creator in the days of your youth. This word youth is the same word that's used in chapter 11 when it's translated young man, Baruch thing. Okay? This is the same word here. So we see that this is a continuation of the thought that he had in chapter 11 because this is the same word um, in verse 9. says, rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of your young manhood. That word young manhood, again, is, is uh, bekrute. Okay. So let's continue here. Koholeth continuing in his statement to recall or remember God or the creator in the days when you are a young man, a young lad, Right? Before the evil days come, this word evil, again, if we review this, is the Hebrew word ra. Again, 663 times it occurs in the Hebrew scriptures and 31 times it occurs in the book of Ecclesiastes. We've talked about this Hebrew word before. This is nothing new to us. It is translated as bad or evil. Now, again, this word is highly contextual, right? Uh, the way that we understand this word depends on the context, right? And what we're looking at. So this Hebrew word is not discussing a person's nefarious or evil actions or intent, because that's not what the context is talking about. The context here is talking about unfortunate circumstances or events. In this case, the unfortunate circumstance is that one becomes old. That is the unfortunate circumstance or the event. The evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Again, hepech is the Hebrew word here, or kephet. This, this Hebrew word occurs 39 times in the Hebrew scriptures, 17 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. This word is a noun. And it means essentially a desire, a longing, a good pleasure, or a thing that one takes enjoyment in, right? Um, that's kind of the idea. And again, this word is contextual as well. In some places, it is translated as event, particularly in uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Um, but in this text here, in the context, we are talking about something or, so, or what someone takes delight or pleasure in. The general context is here is that the evil days that Koaleth is referring to uh, from the context, it's not referring to wicked people. It's not referring to nefarious actions. It's not referring to people causing damage or anything else like that. But it would appear that when a person enters 
old age. Okay. Now, Koholath, that is Solomon, is getting ready to outline how this is, why these are known as unfortunate days or evil days, as it's translated, right? Why is it that Koholath or Solomon sees these things as unfortunate? Well, let's look at some of his style, the stylistic writing of Koholath. This happens, um, this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, section in chapter 12. If you read it, you're kind of like, what in the world is going on here? He's talking about grinding mills and he's talking about clouds with no rain and he's talking about what does all of this have to do, particularly with old age? This doesn't make any sense. Why doesn't he just explain it? Well, he is explaining it. He oftentimes, particularly in figurative language, will use other things to discuss other things. In this case, Koholeth is going to use nature, and I would even say some of the practices of the culture, to discuss the importance of this particular period of time. Okay, As a matter of fact, to be honest with you, He's done this throughout the entire book of Ecclesiastes. This is not new, okay? In the preceding statements of Koholath, he uses the aspects and the activity of creation to make a point. You know, oftentimes he could just state it out, but you remember it when figurative language is used. It's more likely that you'll remember it more, right? Because the referent that he's using is creation itself. Right. So when you look at the clouds in the sky, you'll remember, oh, yeah, Koalat talked about this. Right. Or when you look at grinding people in the grinding mill, I don't know. We don't have any grinding mills here. But if we did. Right. You would go, oh, yeah. Koalat used that to make this point. I can see that now. This happens in poetry. This happens in literature. This is a literary device. OK. As a matter of fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 5 and 7, we see that Koheleth uses nature to talk about the cyclical nature of life itself. For example, he says this. He says, also the sun rises and the sun sets and the hastening to its place and it rises there again, blowing towards the south, then turning towards the north. The wind continues swirling along on its circular courses, the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full to the place where the rivers, there they flow again. He's not talking about going to the river on a vacation and looking at this. He's talking about the cyclical nature of life, particularly within this context. He brings up generations. Generations come, generations go. He brings up things Things that were new, they're really not new. They're just old things rehashed with new names, maybe perhaps new paint, right? He brings up the same thing here, that nothing really never changes. We come and go, but the earth remains, right? The activities of life remain. Same thing in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12 says two are better than one because they have a good return on their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? If one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of street, three strands is not quickly torn apart. He's not talking about rope, you know, exactly. He's talking about the strength of something, particularly in the context of having companions, right? But he's using a cultural reference or a product, if you will, to underscore this point. So if a person has a cord of three strands and they're looking at this, oh, yeah, I remember Koalev talked about that, particularly with the strength of companionship, right? We see this again in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 
verse 6. For as the crackling of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of a fool. He's not talking about getting thorn bushes and crackling them in fire. He's using this to compare the laughter of a fool, that there is a, it's of no use. It is of no value. It is annoying, right? He, said, he does the same thing in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 12. Moreover, man does not know his time, like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare. So the sons of men are ensnared in an evil time or an unfortunate time when it suddenly falls on them. He's not talking about fishing, right? He's talking about how things surprise us, things that come around the corner, and he uses the example of fish caught in nets and birds caught in snares. They're unaware of things too, right? And they it comes upon them. And of course, the last one that we looked at in the first, in the last couple of weeks, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse one. Cast your bread on the surface of the water for you will find it after many days. He's not talking about doing this, right? There is a, there is a different point that he's making here, right? To, and I think I underscore that to live carefree, right? To not be, so do not hold things so tightly, right? Because you don't really lose anything. So, again, using nature, he's done this throughout this whole time. Using culture, he's done this throughout this entire book, right? To underscore how important these concepts are and for us to remember them. Well, he's going to use the activity of creation and culture to describe the physical parts of the body that are taken over by old age. That's the point here. Okay. Now, once you read it like this, it makes complete sense, right? Holy smokes. Now I know why he's talking like this. Let's, uh, let's go through this. Chapter 12, verse 2. It reads like this. It says, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. This is interesting here. The word darken is the word kasak. And we talked about this word before. Okay, We've seen it before in the previous chapter. Okay? So the luminaries, that is the lights, are darkened and dimmed. Well, what? why are they darkened? That's a question to ask. Not that they disappear. The luminaries never disappear. Okay. The light is, the sun is always there. The, the greater light is there. The lesser light are there. The stars also, the luminaries, the asters, they don't disappear. But they are obstructed when they're darkened. Okay. How or why are they obstructed? What obstructs them? And the clouds return after the rain. Now, this is interesting. We don't really think about this one pretty much, but usually after a real good rain, what usually happens after a rain shower? Well, clouds break through. You can see the sky usually when, uh, when clouds are broken up and there's a, a, there's a good heavy rain. You can see the blue sky without obstruction. The, the clouds obstruct one's view of the sky. That is the blue sky, right? Particularly after a rain. So what is, how does the moon, how do the stars, how does the light get darkened and how is this pointing to old age? Well, if you think about it, what do we look at with the luminaries? Our eyesight. 
It is eyesight that is influenced or affected by old age. When you're young, well, most commonly, you have pretty good sight, unless, of course, you wear corrective lenses like most of us here, right? But for the most part, you can see pretty well. But over time, your eyes deteriorate. You begin to start to squint, right? You have to get bifocals, right? Or if you can't afford those, you're just going to have to go without them. Well, as you get older, your, your eyesight gets more affected. And it obstructs your clear view. It obstructs your vision. So remember the you remember your remember the creator in the days of your youth why because you're going to have a hard time seeing right um, you're going to need some help what about 123 in the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and the mighty men stoop so we have eyesight that's impacted and then the day of the watchman of the house. Now, we don't have any watchmen in the house. Um, um, I guess you could say us husbands are watchmen of the house. But, uh, but we don't have any watchmen of the house, right? And mighty men stoop. What is the word here? Tremble. Let's look at this word. Zua is the Hebrew word here. Three times it occurs in the Hebrew scriptures. And it occurs one time in the book of Ecclesiastes. Of course, that's here in this text. The word translated can be to shake, to tremble, okay, as we see here, or to be moved someplace. This word is in the qual stem. It is active, right? So this individual is doing said shaking or trembling. And this word in this context, that is when the uh, watchmen of the house tremble, involves or discussing when the body develop shaking or tremors. Okay. How about, and the mighty men stoop? So when the day of the watchmen of the house, the watchmen of the house are supposed to keep guard. They are supposed to watch over the house, but they can't do that because they're having problems keeping focus and, they're, and they can't seem to control their body as it shakes. We see this in our culture too with older individuals, right? Who lose coordination of their body and they end up shaking as a result of it. See, when you're young, you don't necessarily have those issues or those challenges physically, but as you get older, and those things begin to deteriorate inside of your body. We can talk about uh, dendrites and we can talk about uh, male and sheath and we can throw out all those terms. I won't bore you with those. But the main point is, is the fact that the, the, the person loses coordination. And the mighty men stoop. Arvath is the Hebrew word here for stoop. Occurs 11 times in the Hebrew scriptures. Three times it occurs here in the book of Ecclesiastes. And depending on the context that it's found in, it could be to be crooked, bent, or perverted. Now, that's the, the word, the way that we use perverted is a little bit different than the way that it's translated. It just means twisted, con con contorted. It's, it's, it's not straightened. That's what we mean here. The word is in the hip elf stem which means it is reflective. It is the reciprocal action of the qual stem in this statement. In this case, um, 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 the qual stem in this particular passage is uh, tremble. So this word underscores a person who hunches over due to their deterioration of their posture and poor flexibility. Again, as you get older, things get affected, things get impacted, and a person who loses their stature hunches over, right? Now, they used to be mighty men, strong when they were young, right? But now, because they are older, 
they lose that strength, right? And they are hunched over. So we got a couple of things affected by old age. First of all, bones are affected by old age. And also, um, we can also put, again, uh, strength as well. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 3, we read this. The grinding ones stand idle because they are few. And those who look through the windows grow dim. We will look at that one. Uh, the ones who look through the windows grow dim. We'll look at that one next week. We're going to spend the, the last remaining time talking about the grinding ones. Okay. Now, the word for grinding in this text is tokan in Hebrew. Eight times it occurs in the Hebrew scriptures, this word here. And of course, this appears one time in the book of Ecclesiastes, which is in this text here. This word translated means to grind or to crush something, okay? So uh, a person who grinds things, like in a mill or a person who crushes things, this would be the word here, to con. The term for stand idle is bata. This word is the only time this uh, occurs in the entire Hebrew scriptures. Talk. Now, this word is translated here to stand idle, but really it is translated to cease. So you can actually say uh, uh, the watchmen of the house tremble and the mighty men stoop. The grinding ones cease because they are few. Um, this one says stand idle, but, uh, but you can translate that as cease and you wouldn't have any problem with that. This word is in the qual stem, so it is active. And this word is in the sequential perfect. What in the world is this? What is the sequential perfect? Well, it's a $200 word, but it's a really easy concept. It's very similar to an imperfect verb in Hebrew. However, this word in this type that is the sequential perfect connects to an earlier verb in the sequence. In this case, the verb that it connects to is the word stoop. It has the same type or the same kind of action as the verb that immediately precedes it, right? So again, we're talking about a complete thought of Kohaleth here, okay? So the reason again that they're, that they're standing idle is because of the fact they have all these other things. Now, the word few, we will continue on here, ma'at, 22 times it occurs in the Hebrew scriptures. It occurs one time in the book of Ecclesiastes. It is here. And it basically is translated the very same way we see it. It, it means diminish. It means less. It means few, little. Um, that's basically it. <clears throat> This word is in the PL stem. Again, expresses with the action as intensive. It could be either intensive, it could be either the result or the cause, right, of something. In this case, this is the result why the grinding ones cease or stand idle because they are few or diminished. So it is the result of this, right? So think about, you know, a, a per, people working in the grinding mills. They don't have enough people, right? They, and they're kind of just here. Like, I, you know, I can't do my job because this person isn't here. They're kind of just standing around. The work ceases, right? Well, what does this all mean? Koholeth is highlighting the effect of a person who is becoming older because they lack grinding ones 
or teeth. Again, as a result of actions of old age that occurs to their body, that is their stooping. So we have a whole bunch of things going on here of why Kohalath mentions that these are evil days. These are unfortunate days, right? The person that used to be handsome isn't as handsome as they used to be when they were younger. The person who was stronger isn't as stronger when they used to be when they're younger. The person who had blackened hair doesn't have a lot of blackened hair when they're older. The person who used to be fit, although still may be fit, isn't as fit as they were when they were younger. These are evil days indeed, right? But this is the reality of living under the sun getting older, right? So here's the sum up as I'm finishing very early, you're welcome. Koaleth is continuing his line of reasoning and thought from the statements from the previous chapter or chapters, if you want to look at it this way, that if one wastes their youth, they're going to live with regrets when they get older. that you ought to be wise when you're young because you don't lose that irrespective of how old you are. You may lose your, uh, your, your teeth. You may lose the, black, uh, the blackness of your hair. You may lose your strength. You may even lose bone density, but the one thing that you will always have with you is your wisdom. And Kohalath mentions that you better start young. And you need to live intentionally while you're young. Because if you don't, and your youth goes by, you will have regretted living as you did when you were younger, if you don't live wisely. By the way, TikTok has is an amazing uh, platform, as well as all other social media, because for some reason, a lot of younger people like to put their business out on TikTok. I, I don't know why that is, but they seem to do that. Um, but if you peruse through TikTok, you'll find that there's a lot of individuals who are in their 30s, in their 40s, even some in their 50s. And even in their early 60s, that always complain about their regrets of living the way that they did when they were younger. That they had the whole world open to them, right? And instead of pursuing things worthwhile, they wasted their time making decisions that were of no value. And they are just as lost and confused as they were when they were younger. That is the warning that Kohaleth gives that individuals ought to avoid, right? Live intentionally and wisely in your youth and you won't have that problem when the evil days come. And when you'll say, I have no pleasure in any of this. One ought to enjoy their youth and all the privileges that come with being young because a person's physical body over time is not going to work as well or maybe not even look as well. So live your life with wisdom from your creator. That is the punchline. He starts the punchline in verse one and wants to carry that all the way to the end of the chapter, which is why these details are here. We will continue looking at some of the observations that Kohaleth makes um, with the physical body using culture and nature to underscore this next week. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you so much. This could be a downer chapter, but it is not. It gives us instruction of how to live with wisdom and not regret our lives when we get older and we can do nothing about it. I thank you, Lord, that um, we, we often don't focus on how to live on this earth with such detail. But Lord, thank you that you, by way of Kohaleth, has given us uh, all, of this, all of this information so that we may learn how to live productively um, the best we can with what we have here, your wisdom. Thank you so much, Lord, for it's in your son's name. Amen.